General, as you're aware, historically, Afghanistan is a difficult and a complex country to control, especially for the foreign forces and the foreign empires. Um, U.S. has been very keen to move out of Afghanistan for pretty long, particularly after Osama bin Laden was killed on the 1st of May 2011. Uh, despite the agreement that the U.S. and the Taliban had on 29th February uh, 2020, as also the intra-Afghan talks of September 2020, it is uh, felt that not much progress has really happened according to the agreement that was signed. Um, Taliban continued to increase in its strength. They also continue to increase their hold on the territory. As also, there has been an increase in the violence levels, the incidents, killings over the last one year, and particularly after the announcement was made by, by the President Joe Biden about one month and five, ten days ago. My question to you is, with your experience of Afghanistan, before that, I would say that uh, President Joe Biden actually has announced withdrawal of all U.S. and the coalition forces from Afghanistan by 11th September. In fact, he has made it clear that there will be no condition-based withdrawal, which is contrary to what President Barack Obama said in 2011. He actually made a mention that it will be a condition-based transition, as also it will be ensuring that there will be a responsible drawdown of troops from Afghanistan. Now, General, with your experience and expertise on Afghanistan and knowing what the situation in Afghanistan is and likely to be, what advice would you actually have given to President Joe Biden regarding the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan? And the second part of the question is, post the pullout of troops from Afghanistan in September 2021, what in your view would be the scenario in Afghanistan and its impact on the region as a whole. Over to you, General. General Petraeus, you mu muted, sir. First of all, thanks very much, General, for the kind invitation uh, to spend time with you and the students and the cadets and uh, the others, the veterans and others who are listening in on this session. Uh, and thanks for a great first question. Uh, you asked what would my advice have been? Uh, quite directly, it would have been to sustain a commitment in Afghanistan that is sustainable. Uh, and sustainability is measured in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure. Uh, I think that 3,500, which is what we have in Afghanistan right now, together with 7,000 coalition and probably 10 to 15,000 contractors who do a lot of maintenance and so forth. I think that's very sustainable, uh, especially when you consider that we haven't had a single battlefield loss in over a year. Uh, we've literally lost more troops and training accidents at one single location in the United States on the West Coast than we have lost in all of the wars that are ongoing right now over the course of the last year. Uh, and so I would have sustained that commitment. In fact, let me back up and offer for you what I think are the five lessons that all of us should have taken. And I believe this applies to your country and your region as well as all the others, should have taken from the 20 years of war that we've had most significantly since the 9-11 attacks, war with Islamist extremists. The first lesson uh, is that ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world will be exploited by Islamist extremists. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. The second lesson is that you actually have to do something about it. You cannot study the problem of extremism, terrorism until it goes away. It doesn't go away, it tends to get worse. And in the meantime, while you're studying it, it tends to spew violence, extremism, instability, and refugees, not just into neighboring countries, but in the case of, say, Syria, which was a meltdown of a country, a geopolitical Chernobyl, as we have described it. The refugees went all the way into Europe and the countries of our NATO allies 
causing the biggest domestic political challenges they experienced since the end of the Cold War. The third lesson is that the U.S. generally has to lead in the most significant cases of this kind of Islamist extremists taking advantage of ungoverned spaces. That's not to say that there can't be cases such as France and Mali, the Philippine special ops down in the southern Philippines, certainly what you all are doing in various places in, in the smaller cases of this. But when you're talking about the really significant developments, the Islamic State establishing a caliphate in Iraq and Syria, uh, the Islamic State or, or, or its affiliate in Al Qaeda in Yemen, uh, various places in Africa, certainly in the Afghanistan, Pakistan area and so forth. Again, the U.S. generally has to lead because we have such a preponderance of military capability that is most useful in these cases. And here I'm talking most significantly about the armada of drones that we can put over a battlefield, over an area, uh, to track the actions of insurgents and terrorists and extremists, then the precision strike capability of our close air support, and also sometimes overlook the ability to fuse intelligence, to take intelligence from all different data sets, often dissimilar data sets, to fuse it, to integrate it, all sources, and to make sense out of it. And we have a unique capacity to do that at scale. Um, I, I totaled up one time all of the orbits that different countries around the world that might be our partners could establish. And I think the U.S. has five times the capability of all of the possible allies and partners together if they put everything they had into it, and many of them will not shoot from those platforms. So again, the disparity, keep in mind that we don't just spend more than all of our 29 NATO allies put together now. We spend more than 2.2 .2 or 3 times. So more than twice as much as all of them spend together. And ours is coherent and cohesive. Uh, those are all little penny packets of capabilities. So again, the U.S. has to lead, but it should be a coalition. The coalition should include Muslim countries because this is the biggest threat to them, even more than it is to us. The fourth lesson is very, very important. It is that you cannot counter terrorists with just counter terrorist forces. And by the way, as an aside here, I might ask that everyone put their microphone on mute uh, just so that we minimize the, imp the uh, feedback that we might be hearing. So again, you have to have a comprehensive approach, not just actions of counter-terrorist forces. You can't just drone strike and Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. Um, you can disrupt it, and if that's all you can do, and that has been the case in places like Western Pakistan, Yemen, some others, where the host nation is, is incapable of dealing with the issues or unwilling to do so. But in, in those cases, you have to recognize that you are not truly getting at the heart of the problems. You, again, if you have a comprehensive approach that includes not just counterterrorism force action, but also conventional forces clearing, holding, building, rebuilding, repairing, building host nation forces, gradually transitioning to them and stepping back a bit, 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 and so forth. That is how you really get at the issues. And of course, it has to include political reconciliation, establishment of the rule of law, uh, restoration of basic services, repair of damaged infrastructure, uh, starting schools, health clinics, markets, all of this in a strategic communications campaign and everything. It has to be a truly comprehensive civil military campaign, such as Ambassador Crocker and I were privileged to uh, implement in Iraq. And then the final lesson is really very, very pertinent to Afghanistan, but to all the other locations as well. And that is that the challenge of Islamist extremism is a generational struggle, if not longer. It is certainly not the fight of just a decade, much less a few years. So you have to have a sustained commitment. Wherever it is, you have to try to keep an eye on it. You may not be able to solve some of the problems, uh, such as in Afghanistan, which is a famously difficult context. Keep in mind, in fact, that when I was nominated to be the commander in Afghanistan, I told the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, in Washington that we would not be able to do in Afghanistan what we did in Iraq, that I did believe we could do in Iraq what we did, drive violence down by 85 or 90 percent, keep it down for several subsequent years, 
gradually we're transitioning tasks to Iraqi security forces, all of that, that we actually believe could be done because the context was very different. Afghanistan has the most challenging set of factors, I think, imaginable. It's a landlocked country. It has no money. The enemy headquarters are outside its territory. They're in Baluchistan and North Waziristan, among other locations, as you well know. Uh, and uh, again, it's very highly illiterate. There's very little infrastructure. There's no memory of strong government. Uh, and you have the Himalayas, or at least the Hindu Kush, running through the country. So there's real terrain and real distance with which you have to deal as well. And uh, and again, a total lack of human capital uh, for many of the economic endeavors that you might want to pursue. So again, Afghanistan, we should recognize, is a famously difficult case. You cannot resolve it. So what you do is you manage it. And I would have thought that 3,500 troops out of an active duty force in the U.S. military of 1.6 million people uh, with hundreds of thousands more reserves that take us well over 2 million, that that would have been a modest commitment that was easily sustainable and not uh, overly costly in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure. In this case, clearly, I respect the decision of the president. He has other considerations that military men do not have. I have always acknowledged that in dealing with presidents, uh, including with President Obama, when I sat down and told him, you know, this is what you're getting. This is how I'm going to operate. I will give you my best professional military advice based on the military, the objective facts on the ground, and the mission you have given us informed by an awareness of all the issues with which you have to deal, like domestic politics, that he does have to do that or he doesn't get reelected. Congressional politics, alliance politics, strain on the force, budget deficits, the opportunity cost of having forces in Afghanistan rather than in the Indo-Pacific. All of this I freely acknowledge is beyond my purview. It informs my advice and recommendation but it does not drive it. What drives it is the facts on the ground. And in this case, the facts on the ground would have driven me to say, keep at least 3,500 troops there. That keeps at least 7,000 coalition there. And that keeps, that enables us to maintain 10 to 15,000 contractors who maintain the Afghan Air Force. That air mobility, as you well know, the tactical air mobility of the C-130s and the Black Hawk helicopters the attack capability of their fixed wing attack aircraft and the uh, Little Bird helicopters, the Hughes 500Ds, uh, all of that is crucially important for Afghanistan. They, forces, as you well know, have to have a sense that if they're attacked, someone is going to come to the rescue. And my worry is that psychologically at a certain point, the Afghan forces are going to realize that there is no one coming to the rescue out in far eastern Kunar or Jalalabad or down in Helmand province or Kandahar. And then, as you well know, if the soldiers think psychologically nobody's going to help us, they may go out the back door instead of continuing to fight at the front door. So when you ask me what do I see happening, I fear, I fear that we will see a further erosion of the security situation. We will see a continued campaign by the Taliban, the Haqqani network, the IMU, uh, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, to assassinate uh, key ethnic and sectarian leaders trying to ignite internal strife and trying to eliminate the, the secular, uh, the educated, the prominent business leaders who will resist the kind of medieval theocratic uh, governance that the Taliban would like to reimpose on the country. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that when they last were able to impose their will on the country, Al-Qaeda was allowed to establish a, a sanctuary in Eastern Afghanistan in which the 9-11 attacks were planned and the initial training of the attackers was conducted. One final point just to offer to you, and that is we talk about, well, we are going to support Afghanistan as it's called offshore. Uh, in other words, from outside the country. Well, if you look at where we have forces, it is a very long flight from Qatar, Doha, al Udeed Air Base, even if there's a base maybe in Oman or the UAE. Again, these are very considerable distances and you cannot take the most direct route, which would take you over Iran. That airspace is closed to us and presumably will remain so, although perhaps if there's an agreement that could be opened up. But 
but but it's a, again a several hour flight in the fastest of jets and it has to be refueled several times in route and going back so we have to have a huge tanker fleet flying around as well yes you can park an aircraft carrier off of uh, southwestern Pakistan that's a very costly commitment um, and you still have to have an awful lot of tankers because if you want to have dwell time over Afghanistan and then when it comes to drones we all know that they are famously very very slow they're often single engine prop jets uh, they're also supposed to be quiet so again it can take them six to eight hours just to get over Afghanistan uh, from bases in the Gulf and obviously the dwell time is very reduced then because they are not, at least currently, they're not refuelable. So again, the challenges of operating from outside Afghanistan or quote offshore of a country that doesn't even have a shore uh, and is dependent on two lines of communication uh, through Pakistan, which is a famously fickle partner uh, and won't deal with the extremists on its own soil. Um, or alternatively, you know, going through Germany, Russia, and on down. Again, these are very, very challenging. And with that, General, let me give it back to you, noting that, again, I think you are on mute as well. 